Okay, so I'm Brent Payton. I'm the director of the Thermal Biology Institute, and I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to some Yellowstone stuff. And um, and we'll see how this works. It's Yellowstone is basically a giant volcano. Most people probably know that. Um, it's a result of a, a hot spot that's kind of stationary in on the planet and our continent is moving over the top of it. And so there's a history of volcanic eruptions that go all the way down to Boise, basically as the as the crust goes over the top. And eventually Yellowstone will be in um, approximately Billings. Uh, so it'll be Billings will be at the site of a super volcano interestingly enough, but it may be another 600 million years or something before that happens. So I don't think we have to worry about that at the moment. Um, underneath Yellowstone, Yellowstone's this little green tiny outline. This big giant orange thing here is um, a magma chamber that's been mapped out and it's approximately, last I heard, about 11 times the volume of the Grand Canyon. And so it's 11 Grand Canyons worth of magma underneath where we live, waiting to uh, to blow up at some point. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just just saying what people have figured out. Um, this is the size of the eruptions, uh, volcanic eruptions. So the largest one, the largest one was 600 cubic miles of material that came out in one kind of Eruption, not a single day by any means, but one one uh, period. And how big, it's hard to even figure out what 600 cubic miles is. And so I try to do it. Um, <clears throat> if you drove from here to Seattle and 50 miles on either side of I-90, so the entire distance from here to Seattle would be 46. So it's you know, way above your second, third story house. 50 miles on either side of I-90. And then 21 feet deep on all of Montana. And so again, hope you have a third story apartment if that ever uh, happens again. What's left is um, we have a caldera here in this purple. It's about 40 by 60 miles, 40 by 60. And um, filled with uh, over 10,000 thermal features that are we know about about 55% of the world's hot springs, less than 3% of these hot springs have ever been characterized for microbial life. And so there's 97% of 10,000 springs still left to, for sampling. So lots of work to do for TBI. Um, TBI is an institute that was established in 1999, focused on the Yellowstone um, microbes in Yellowstone and, and integrated Yellowstone statistics. So we don't have sharp borders. It's basically just hot springs focused, but the microfauna rather than the macrofauna of, of Yellowstone. Things have changed a lot in Yellowstone. It used to be bears begging for peanut butter sandwiches at the gate, and now it's um, you know satellite tagged bears tracking them in their natural systems. And it's kind of the same thing with the hot springs. It was thought for a long time hot springs are cool. Pun intended. Um, you know, like yellow, uh, Old Faithful goes off and it's, it's fun to see, but um, with the uh, discovery of microorganisms in the hot springs, the views have changed. It's a lot more um, scientific studies on the microorganisms in the hot springs. And so here you can see two different environments, obviously different chemistry, different, probably different pH, different temperature, even within feet of each other. And each of these springs would have 500 to 1,000 different species of, of microorganisms living in them. And so we may have cyanobacteria, fungi, viruses, um, just about anything, but it all depends on temperature and, and pH, and we have a huge diversity of that in, in Yellowstone. So what are, um, let's see if I can delete that little thing there. I don't even see it on my screen. Um, Thermophiles, or in red, <laughs> is, um, organ are organisms that live in extremely high temperatures. 
And so typically we, we think of temperatures in the 50 to even above the boiling point of water if you're a deep sea type of pool. You can have um, temperature organisms that grow even above 100 degrees C. Some of the low temperature thermophiles that uh, John's going to talk about are more in the 35, 40 degree range. Um, so some if you go home tonight, turn your hot water tap on full blast. Um, most people keep their hot water about 60 degrees C. And so you get an idea that's sort of in the middle range of moderate thermophiles, but would be like way too cold for high temperature, really extreme thermophiles. So they'd still be like freezing. Do you mind just staying closer to the mic? I had someone to know. Oh, fine. Okay. Um, I wonder, do I have any kind of a pointer? I don't really have a pointer, do I? Okay. Um, so I do want to put a plug in for uh, Honors 275 class. If there's any undergrads in here that want to um, join this class next year, we do a seven-day backcountry trip. We're focused on discovering plastic degrading microorganisms. So we've got some organisms that grow at high temperatures and are degrading petroleum-based plastics. From hot springs, we do a, um, a that students do about four nights in Yellowstone in the backcountry, and then we sample hot springs there. So anyway, if there's any undergrads here, put a plug in for that. Um, and then also one other thing, we have graduating seniors and first year PhD students. We have an NSF training program, uh, the NRT National Research Training Program. It's a pretty prestigious um, project that we got. We've got one more cohort to recruit. And so we'll be looking for currently graduating seniors and first year PhD students to apply sometime in the, in the coming semester, in this semester actually, to um, fill that last cohort. So if you have any, any thoughts about staying at MSU for graduate school or you're already here, uh, come and talk to me. So why study thermophiles, uh, thermophilic systems? They have unique biogeochemical interactions. They enhance our knowledge of the biodiversity of life on Earth. Um, they provide clues to conditions potentially on early Earth and evolution. Um, their biosignatures can help us look for life on other planets. Only about 1% of microbe, environmental microbes have ever been grown in a lab, so there's 99% out there to be discovered. Um, tremendous biotech potential, and then for this particular study, introducing John's work, uh, the thermophilic systems have a potential to be model systems for climate change studies. They're already at elevated temperatures. You can find your environment that may be a few degrees hotter than the natural environmental systems and use that as a model for potential climate change um, studies. Okay. I want to introduce a little more. Um, so I did a sabbatical in 2016-17 with um, Dr. Jeff Poussin at CSIRO in Perth. And um, I'm being from the Biofilm Center and Thermophil um, TBI, the Thermobiology Institute. It was a good combination of um, things because these brain-eating amoeba that John's going to talk to you about uh, live at high temperature biofilms. And so it kind of was a natural fit for me to go go work with Jeff. Jeff's probably one of the top three, I would say, uh, people in the world studying pathogenic amoeba. And so it's really uh, great that he's so nice and so willing to collaborate and such a, a perfect person to work with. I'm not gonna spoil all of John's stuff, but basically Nagleria phalari is pathogenic. It can enter your brain, uh, kill you, and it also is found in many lakes and rivers in the U.S. Um, in some of Jeff's studies, it's found that a particular uh, genus of organism, Meothermus, may be its preferred food, but I think we're going to expand that uh, knowledge uh, with studies here in the U.S. Um, in Australia, they have this in their drinking water systems. It turns out we do in the U.S. too. Again, I'm not going to spoil John's talk, but... Um, about 400 people die worldwide from this. So it's not a major killer, but it is a little creepy to take a shower and get a amoeba in your brain and die. Um, 
So in, in Australia, they have um, drinking water pipes that are above ground, and so they get hot in the summer, in the Australian summers, they, the drinking water may be 40 or uh, a little higher uh, degree C. And so it, it's very warm systems uh, in these. And so I got to work with Jeff and go around. He's got biofilm samplers. Let's see, let me go one more. Biofilm samplers all over Western Australia, where he um, where he uh, collects the organisms that live there, and then collects samples for amoeba. And I'm going to go back. These pipelines stretch for hundreds and hundreds of miles into the outback, and so lots of time and biofilm for these amoeba to to uh, grow on in Australia. All right, that's the end of my introduction for John, so I'm just sort of setting the stage of why yellow, why amoeba in Yellowstone and how it relates to um, how we got this project started. Alrighty, um, yeah, so my name is John, I'm a second year PhD student in chemical and biological engineering, and as Brent said, I'll be talking about sort of the colonization, uh, presence, absence of pathogenic free living amoeba in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So just kind of overview of the talk, uh, we're going to do an introduction of just kind of what exactly amoeba are uh, and go into sort of the relevance of research in the GYE. And then finally kind of wrap up with a look at what I'm hoping to do for my thesis research and different methods we're going to employ to study um, free living amoeba. So amoeba are unicellular uh, eukaryotic organisms. They can be both terrestrial and aquatic. Um, really what kind of describe or characteristic of amoeba, I don't know if I had a video I was going to load it, but the characteristic of them is they have these pseudopods, so these kind of clubs that stick out of them, and the way that they move is they kind of slowly stick those out, and then they grab onto the surface and kind of push all the organelles through. So they kind of just look like a little alien kind of slime guy. And... Um, so in the environment, uh, they graze on bacteria, they can graze on algae, other amoeba, pretty much anything that uh, they can engulf and then eventually digest. Um, Free-living amoeba are environmental protozoan pathogens. They're distributed all across the world uh, in environmental systems. And the two um, fatal diseases caused by free-living amoeba are granuloma granulomatous amoebic encephalitis, or GAE, or primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. So before we get into the pathogenic free-living amoeba, I just want to talk about the Trojan horse theory. So uh, when amoeba are grazing in the environment, they can uh, engulf and start to ingest certain bacteria. But every now and then they come across these bacteria that are uh, resistant to the amoeba. And many of these can be pathogens. These are just three that I listed, but there's some more. Uh, so we have Coxiella brunetti, which is the causative agent of Q fever, uh, Legionella with Legionnaires disease, and Yersinia pestis uh, with the plague. And pretty much uh, amoeba is kind of acts as a macrophage, so they have similar kind of responses to bacteria. So once the bacteria get internalized inside of the amoeba, the amoeba is throwing everything it has against the bacteria. And then the bacteria kind of heighten up their virulence response. So we actually see kind of a uh, enhanced virulence uh, in the bacteria. And this kind of leads into the Trojan horse theory. So uh, the theory states that um, free living amoeba may allow uh, amoeba resistant bacteria to more readily cause disease. So pretty much if you think about it, you ingest an amoeba and it has pathogenic bacteria inside of it, then it acts as a Trojan horse and all of a sudden it lets that free and you get attacked with really virulent uh, bacteria. So there's uh, four major uh, genera of pathogenic amoeba. Uh, so we have verm amoeba, acanth amoeba, balamuthia, and aglaria. Uh, all of them kind of have this similar life, uh, life cycle. So their feeding form is a trophozoite stage, and that's kind of when they're just moving around and eating. Uh, trophozoite is the only stage known to cause infection. Um, they reproduce asexually through mitosis, and when they're exposed to stresses in the environment, 
Uh, they can, the glary species have a flagellated form, so they can kind of move around and look for a more favorable environment. But if the conditions are too harsh, they can pretty much uh, push all the water out of the cell and then insist, and they create this really kind of hardy uh, cyst membrane or cyst wall. And some amoeba can live up to about five months uh, in the cyst form. And when they're insisted, they're also a lot more resistant to chlorination, UV, uh, pretty much just most uh, water treatment techniques. So verm amoeba, um, it's actually kind of hard to tell if they do cause a disease. It might just be uh, the Trojan horse theory where they're, the pathogenic bacteria inside of them may be causing disease. <laughs> but their optimal temperature is 28 degrees Celsius, so they're more thermotolerant, not thermophilic. Uh, Canthamoeba and Balamuthia both cause GAE. So uh, GAE is not as uh, lethal as PAM, so it's more, uh, can be deadly for immunocompromised people. And the Canthamoeba and Balamuthia, they both enter the body through skin lesions or the respiratory tract. And the Canthamoeba can also enter through the eye. And if you get an eye infection of a canthamoeba, it can cause severe keratitis and often lead to blindness. So, oh, sorry. Uh, Neglaria species, um, they grow optimally at 37 degrees Celsius. And we'll get to those in a second. So, there's almost 50 characterized species of Neglaria, and Neglaria thalari is the only known human pathogen. So there's two other strains, Neglaria australiensis and Neglaria talica, that both show pathogenicity in animal studies. So in those studies, they pretty much just shoot these uh, australiensis and talica up like mice nose, mice's noses, and they pretty much see a 100% fatality rate in those studies. So Neglaria thalari is different than Canthamoeba and Balamuthia because its only route of entry is through the nose. So it likes to kind of hang out um, more in the sediment uh, along rivers or ponds. And most cases occur in younger ages, so kids that are kind of splashing around in these uh, ponds where Neglaria thalari is. And once it gets up the nose, it kind of starts crawling around and gets up to your brain. And uh, once it's inside of your brain, it doesn't really have any other food sources, so it just slowly starts eating away. And this is, uh, what causes PAM, and it has greater than 97% fatality rate. And if you contract it, you're usually dead within about 20 days. And there's, I think, only about three survival stories of it. And actually with those, uh, they induced a coma in the patients and dropped their body temperature way down. And it pretty much just delayed the response until they could treat, uh, provide treatment. So this study done by Garpure in 2021 uh, really just highlights how climate change may be affecting the distribution of Neglaria thalari. So again, its optimal growth is at 37 degrees Celsius, but its survival range when it's insisted can be 20 degrees C to 65 degrees. And we see um, with the blue dots, uh, starting with the first base in 1978, we're gonna see how it's kind of the southeast. But as we go more towards modern day, we'll see kind of this range increasing to the northwest. And because of this uh, expansion of geographical range, the EPA has it listed as a path an emerging pathogen on their contaminant candidate bio uh, biological list. So, like Brent said, Neglaria thalari can survive in engineered systems and also natural environments. Uh, so these PAM case studies, the first one was in July of a two-year-old kid uh, getting Neglaria thalari in a hot spring. And the second one was in March, actually, of a guy in Florida that used a neti pot sinus rinse straight out of his tap water and actually uh, got Neglaria thalari from uh, the tap water. So in the environment, um, we do see a lot of a lot of detection in thermal features. So this study by Sheehan in 2003 shows the uh, glaria being detected in the Boiling River in Yellowstone. And then the second one by Ward in 2023 that just came out, um, 
was looking at treated water systems, so post-treatment in Louisiana, and they actually detected Nagleria phalari in almost 11, I think 11 counties across Louisiana. And to build off this in Louisiana, Lake Pontchartrain, just outside of New Orleans, has also been shown to harbor Nagleria phalari. So we're starting to see it more often in water distribution systems in the U.S., and the big key here is it's post-chlorination, so po post-treatment. So for some reason, Fowler is able to get through the chlorination and then thrive in the water distribution systems. So if we update our geographical map uh, with these case studies and also known detections, uh, I added the yellow circles to kind of highlight uh, the more recent detections and cases. So we really do start to see this Northwestern movement of Nagleria phalari across the US. So my research goals, um, the first one is to kind of characterize uh, exactly what biotic and abiotic factors are really affecting uh, the presence or absence of free living amoeba in natural systems. So with this, we're kind of looking more at the correlations between pathogenic and non-pathogenic species. Uh, second is to understand kind of the fundamental interactions of free living amoeba and specifically phalari uh, in natural biofilm systems. So with this, uh, we know that in Australia, phalari preferentially feeds on neothermus. So we want to know exactly what it's eating in the environment if it is neothermus. And third uh, is to kind of go into the differences between these natural and engineered systems. So the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem provides a really good um, kind of area for studying phalari. So this, these two hot springs are in Grand Teton National Park. So the first one's Polecat Hot Spring, uh, which has been shown over and over again to be Nagleria phalari positive. And the second is Huckleberry Hot Spring, which harbors Nagleria australiensis. And you see in Huckleberry right here, the metal ring, uh, it actually used to be a commercial soaking spot, so they had cabins there and you could go and soak. But these are actually both temporarily closed, put in quotations because people still soak at these all the time. But they're actually only 0 0.3 miles away as the crow flies. So we sampled these last week and it's like less than a 10 minute walk in between the two. So looking at these systems, we really want to ask what it, like why exactly Polecat harbors phalari and Huckleberry has Australiensis. So looking into this, uh, we first pulled up some just basic water quality data from the USGS. So these are some of their samples from 2016 all the way to 2019. And we actually see that both these systems are very similar, especially when we look at temperature and pH. And it's right at that ideal temperature for phalari, about 35 to 45 degrees Celsius. And there is a couple outliers up in organic carbon and DO, but for the most part, they are pretty similar systems. So then looking into the sequencing data, 16S sequencing, uh, this data was generated from Illumina 16S next gen sequencing and was processed using UPARS. Um, these, if you look at the legend, H1 through H4, P1 through P4, they're average triplicates uh, from four sampling dates. And this is hot off the press. I pretty much finished this last night. So <laughs> I didn't have a whole lot of time to run analyses, but uh, if we start looking into these um, tepid tepidimonas, um, which harbors, uh, or which is found in both polecat and huckleberry, is a known thermophilic organism found in hot springs, uh, same with erythrobacter. And one interesting thing we see here is rickettsia coming out of polecat. So we have the uncultured rickettsia and another rickettsia, rickettsiella species. So rickettsia is the cause of agent of Rocky Mountain spotted fever and is often, or it's transmitted through ticks, but there is actually multiple studies showing it um, actually surviving and replicating inside of hot springs. So moving on, uh, kind of starting the statistical analyses is looking at the heat map. 
And really the takeaway here is if we look at polecat, the relative abundance scale is up to 0.05, so 5% of the total reads compared to Huckleberry's 25%. So it looks like polecat is a much diverse uh, thermal feature than Huckleberry, that really there isn't one predominant organism here. And without having any uh, statistical data, it's hard to draw conclusions, but it looks from the eye that there really isn't any correlations between 16S communities between the two. So in addition to doing molecular work, we also do enrichment cultures. So we pretty much take uh, hot spring sediment or water and throw it on a plate and we let it grow. And once we do start seeing some amoeba growing, then we scoop that up, throw it on a new plate and try to eventually isolate a single amoeba. So this photo right here kind of shows an amoeba, amoeba growth front. So this is sort of the heat killed E. coli lawn. This is the amoeba growth front. And then back here, you kind of see some cysts and trophozoites just kind of lingering back. Uh, so with the polecat uh, samples, uh, we actually ran enrichments, uh, isolated the amoeba, and then uh, spun that down to a pellet and sent it off for metagenomic sequencing. So these are some of the uh, bacteria that actually uh, pre and post enrichment, we saw them uh, really bump up in sequencing hits. So it's just a list of uh, some pathogens. We have coliform bacteria, fecal contamination bacteria, and also some opportunistic pathogens. And then if we look more closely into these, uh, these five bacteria are actually able to be harbored inside of the amoeba. So it could point more towards that Trojan horse theory. And one thing to note also is these are grown on heat killed E. coli. So this E. coli hit uh, may just be the background noise. So while looking at polecat and huckleberry, uh, we can kind of say that despite their close proximity and similar water quality data, um, the two hot springs show different 16S communities. Um, one theory or prediction is that Nagleria australiensis may just be out competing Phalari and Huckleberry. So Jeff Puzon down in Australia, uh, he has a publication pending where he actually grew Phalari and australiensis and let them compete. And he shows that australiensis actually dominates Phalari, that it pretty much takes it over. So it's kind of out there, but maybe australiensis was introduced to Huckleberry and then took over that system. Um, the polecat enrichments indicate that potentially pathogenic bacteria um, are surviving and living in the uh, living in the hot springs. Um, this also supports the Trojan horse theory that maybe the amoeba are internalizing the bacteria. And finally, uh, we're looking at broader sampling area to further study the distribution of specific pathogenic amoeba interactions. So that brings us to our kind of map of sampling. So we have polecat and huckleberry uh, down here, right at the south end of the park. And really across Yellowstone, we're looking at kind of that uh, ideal temperature range for foul rice, so 30 to 45 degrees Celsius. And we're also looking for more of the like legal swimming or soaking areas, so places where people might be submerging their heads underwater, and also places with a lot of recreations. So we like to think of like fishing, if a fisherman slips and falls, maybe it'll get some water up their nose. So when we're field sampling, um, we run through a series of filtrations and also collect sediment from molecular work. So with the filtrations, we run uh, from 20 micron filters down to 0.22 micron filters. So we see that the amoeba kind of get caught up on the 10 micron. And then we send each of those off for sequencing. We might be able to see uh, exactly what the amoeba are internalizing. And we also do just a bulk 0.22 micron uh, just for the kind of background, get the whole picture. Uh, we run through extractions with the power water and power biofilm extraction kits. And we also run quantitative polymerase chain reaction for an, an initial kind of presence absence test. And then on the culturing side, um, 
We collect more of that sediment slurry, so kind of right at the interface of sediment in the water is, we, we think that's kind of where the amoeba hang out more. Um, but we grow them on non-neutrine agar plates uh, with heat killed E. coli, and we run passages on them. Um, then we send off the DNA extractions of the pellets uh, for sequencing. So these are some of the sample spots that we just went to this last week. So this one's in this river. Um, Coming out of this hot spring is about 70 degrees Celsius, but moving down towards the soaking spot was right in that 35 degrees C range. Uh, we hit the boiling river, so that's what it now looks like uh, after the flood. It's completely different. But we're curious to see if we can maybe get any phalari hits out of there. And then this last one was in the Heart Lake Basin. Um, we actually got caught in a really nasty hailstorm, thunderstorm. Yep. And <laughs> We had to cut the sampling short there. So to analyze the samples, uh, like I said, we go to that initial detection uh, using qPCR. Uh, if we do get any positive hits through qPCR, then we send them off for ITS sequencing just to confirm uh, if that amplified region is in fact phalari. Uh, we do Illumina 16 next gen sequencing uh, to get the bacterial immunities uh, for each sample. And one thing that we're looking into is doing a uh, single cell sequencing to see exactly what the amoeba are internalizing. So this is some, uh, something we did this summer. So there's this company called uh, ACD Bio, and they do customized uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization probes. So pretty much just a probe, fluorescent probe that sticks to uh, an exact DNA sequence. So we're testing these out, looking at specific acanth amoeba and Aguaria phalari probes. So this was supposed to be one of our negative controls with Huckleberry, because we know that acanth amoeba and uh, Aguaria phalari aren't found in there. But we actually, uh, when we stained them and ran them through the confocal, uh, we stained with DAPI for the blue nuclei and nucleic acids. Acanth amoeba is green, phalari was magenta. And we actually see that both um, the green and magenta are uh, staining these cells. So we're not exactly sure um, what these are. We figure they're Nuglaria australiensis, but you can see clearly that we have some cyst formation here. And this guy right here, it's kind of, you can see the uh, blue nucleus right here. So that's actually a trophozoite form uh, with internalized bacteria. And when we look at the fluorescent image, uh, we see kind of this white fluorescent coming out of some of the cysts. So that's both the acanth amoeba and the phalari probe fluorescing and blending together to make white. So this is something that we're super excited about to make some really awesome images, but we're gonna need to do some tweaking to make them specific. So to wrap it up, uh, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem provides a great environment to study phalari. We know that it's already there. And now we can open up our uh, sampling area and maybe see if we can detect it elsewhere. Uh, I'm cur currently processing samples uh, from this year from molecular work. Um, we're doing some initial culturing of this year's Polecat Huckleberry Hot Spring, and that's Dr. Sandra Hallinan down in Micro. She's probably plating the, the samples right now as we speak. And last, uh, I'm working on the biosafety protocols so we can start running some experiments in our lab in Barnard. So I'd like to thank uh, the whole Peyton Lab and Dr. Sandra Hallinan uh, for all their help, uh, from the USGS, Elliot and Paul for helping with collecting some samples, uh, Jeff from CSRO for just all the help, uh, RML for some funding and also imaging uh, this summer, and then all my funding sources, so Chemie and BioE Department, NSF, Montana IOE, Montana Waterworks, and also the MSU Outreach and Engagement Council. And with that, I'll take any questions. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. So they kind of, it ranges depending on the cycling season, but we see them kind of hanging right around that 38, 39, up to 45 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. um, 
in line with human excuse, whatever it is, if it's implemented factually or to or to or not. Um, I haven't looked super close into it, honestly. Um, I don't know. From the initial readings, there was only uh, a couple uncultured, like archaea species from each. It was most predominantly bacteria popping out. But once I get in deeper, maybe we'll see more archaea coming out of it. One of the things I find interesting with this is there's not a lot of overlap in the genus, in the genera, but in the two things. Even though they're pretty close water quality wise and, and physically, they're still quite different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so cool. Yeah, uh, keep, keep them going. There's two different like diseases, states, things of our mm -hmm. species, mm -hmm. which is maybe caused by more important, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other one, uh, are they both like kind of the same disease progression where the amoeba gets into your brain? Or your mm -hmm. Having more to do with the bacteria that it could bring in? Uh, yeah, so I think G. Oh, yeah. Um, so this question was the difference between uh, PAM and GAE. Um, so I'm not quite sure. I haven't read much about GAE. Uh, pretty, once it gets to the brain, it does eat different parts of the brain as PAM does. I know that. And I think really the main distinction is just that when Negleria affects or infects with PAM, it goes straight to the brain. Where GAE, it can, these Balamuthian acanthamoeba can kind of live in your system for months until they eventually cross the blood brain barrier. So it's a slower onset of symptoms and kind of just like that chronic uh, sickness for a couple months. But the, the ego uh, causes them to go into the different stage of like sort of the pressure. Yeah, so that's just uh, nutrient availability pretty much. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so this question was, what causes amoeba to switch between the stages, between cysts, trophs, and flagellated forms? Uh, so yeah, it's all just based off of nutrient uh, availability or geochemistry. So, you know, if there's a flood and the temperature drops to 20 degrees Celsius, just like that, then they'll insist and wait it out until hopefully uh, you get back to the optimal temperature. So just environmental stresses. Yeah. So is that how we think that these are moving into other places like moving northwest in the US? Or like there's been stages of these amoeba that are now having more nutrients to become transform. Mm -hmm. Are they like somehow being carried to new locations? Yeah. We don't know. No one, yeah, they don't really know. There's people think that maybe um like when a bird uh, dips into the water and gets it, it'll fly somewhere else and then die. And it, when it decomposes, then cholera gets spread. So things like that, but no one really knows for sure. Jen? You mentioned uh, the like causative agents in bronchial fever mm -hmm. um, can persist outside of a venture spring. Mm -hmm. Do they? Do people hypothesize it's also true for like other vector? Um, requiring pathogens that they can like harbor in this like environment without like a vector mm -hmm. or a host because there's like one or not. I, I'm not. Oh, yeah. So that one was um, there's been some research showing that rickettsia can persist in hot springs. So can other vector borne illnesses survive in hot springs? And I don't know. I haven't read super really deeply into it yet, so, yeah. Why don't you think there's like more, or if, if, if um, this amoeba has been found in water, like drink water, drinking water, mm -hmm. why don't you think there have been more? Um, well. Is it just those like three? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's actually been some studies done on aerosolization of phalari, and pretty much the conclusion is that you can't get phalari from aerosolized uh, particles, like from showering. So you're not going to get it from steam coming up. I think that's really it. Um, I know 
there's been four neti pot cases in the US. So it's mostly when people just really put a blast of water up their nose. And yeah, and also, uh, so France has a legal like warning system for phthalo and water. I think it's 10 organisms per, per cubic meter. Do you know, Brent? I think that's it. So yeah, so 10 organisms per cubic meter is really isn't that much. So even if it is in water distribution systems, I think you just have to be really unlucky to get that 500 mils in the neti pot in your nose where the phthalari is. So, yeah. yeah. From your eligible science data, mm -hmm. you can have Yeah. Were those the exact sites? Uh, no. So, those were, as far as I know, those were the same sites. Uh, the hot springs really aren't um, super big. So, yeah, they're just the different uh, samples. Dates that they're sampled, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess we can. So two of them were right at 925. So I guess actually these three right here. So really kind of differing temperature range from 39, 45, 42C. Yeah, I'm just wondering if like that changes yeah mm -hmm. you might see something in your cpcr that suggests mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah i'm sure there probably is yeah you know i'm still pretty new to the whole uh bioinformatic stuff so hopefully you know, once i master it then we'll get more correlations mm -hmm. All right. So just a general question of how uh, how new are the tools that you guys are using in this study? Could you have done this when TBI started? I don't know how long time it was. Um, when TBI started, people were doing like UDTE, and you'd, you'd get little bands that might indicate you know the top five organisms, and this is this is you know doing complete. Uh, metagenomes and, and qPCR. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's in the state of the art currently, but would have been impossible. I don't even know. Impossible 10 years ago for sure. So, uh, around the time TBI got started, they ignored uh, uh, microbiome. He enrolled in my general ecology class. With the idea that you all were learning to identify in, uh, species in general for the first time ever. And he thought that community ecology principles <laughs> were developed for uh, macro organisms might be relevant. And I'm just completely floored me that all of a sudden, capacity to identify these uh, organisms. Coming into existence, and uh, your study here is a really good example. Yeah, it, it's amazing what can be done currently with, with DNA based analyses, RNA based analyses. It's come so far to be the And EPA is keeping up and, and uh, protecting us all from uh, unsafe water. No. I don't want to say anything about that. <laughs> I don't want to say tap water in your neti pot. That distilled. Yeah, they say with phalari, you want to boil for about 20 minutes to be safe. And this is. Yeah. So it's a long time to boil your water. I would hold your nose if you jump into the hot tank outdoors. <laughs> I would, just as a aside, when I was in Australia on a sabbatical, one of the students in death lab from the outback um, said that her parents always told her to hold her nose when she jumped into the water and that's a foul right? Because it's prevalent in the for hot springs. Yeah. If yeah. you go under, it's holding out. Mm -hmm. 